and do all of you. I'm going to make this a little, my introduction a little bit personal. Um, since Frances, uh, I don't know if I've ever said this to her as directly as this, is sort of my intellectual hero among sociologists of all time. Uh, and I want to explain why that is a little bit. By making reference to, um, some of you remember I've read Michael Burroy's discussion of public sociology. And according to Michael, there are four kinds of sociologists. One is the professional sociologist. That's the sort of person who writes articles in ASR, AJS, for the profession. <clears throat> Second kind of sociologist is um, uh, a policy sociologist. This is the sort of person who writes uh, papers, does research that is uh, focused, whose audience is more of the public policy community, governments, government agencies, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> A third kind of sociologist is what he calls critical sociologists. And these are folks who spend a lot of time uh, sort of critiquing, if you like, the foundations of our discipline and how we approach the questions we ask and the kinds of questions that we ask. Uh, the fourth kind of sociologist he calls a public sociologist. And he means sort of two different things by this. One is kind of what you might think of, maybe you're the sort of guy who writes, uh, like Krugman, or you write articles for the New York Times. Uh, <clears throat> but he also means something else. And it's what the left used to call an organic intellectual. That is someone whose research agenda is rooted in social movements, the community, uh, and, and moving some agenda from the community forward. Now, Michael makes the point that <clears throat> these four boxes that he invented uh, are not necessarily totally separate from one another. And he, he suggests, well, some of us might do professional sociology on Monday, policy sociology on Tuesday, critical sociology on Thursday, and uh, <clears throat> public sociology over the weekend. Right? They're, they're, not, they're not necessarily things that are just associated with uh, a person and they're one, having one identity. Fran is unique because in all that she's done over her whole career, she always occupies all four boxes at the same time. Her work is always at the highest standards of the profession. This is scholarly, high quality scholarly work that has won her many awards and many distinctions from the profession. <coughs> She's always been, everything she writes has an element of critical sociology in it. Throughout her whole career, Fran has been an organic intellectual, going back to the poor people's movements, the women's movements of the late 60s and early 70s. And her books reflect that organic link uh, to these uh, movements. She's also been what I would call a policy sociologist. Um, <clears throat> about a little over a decade ago, uh, <coughs> her long time, I had lunch with uh, her long time partner and co colleague Richard Cloward and a few other friends. And Richard and I had this side conversation while Fran was talking to someone else. And Richard was always so proud of, pr pr proud of Fran. And he pulls out these photos. He says, John, you got to look at this. And there was a photo of Fran standing behind. Uh, President Clinton, while well, President Clinton was signing what in the States is known as the uh, Voter Motor Registration Act. Is that well, Motor Voter. Motor Voter, then. It's actually okay. the National Voter Registration Act right. of 1993. Which was an act that was aimed at increasing voter participation in the United States. That came out of the research that Fran started, I guess, in the late 70s on why poor people don't vote. Now, it's hard for me to think of many social scientists 
much less uh, any sociologists, who can point to a major piece of legislation as being a product not only of their activism, but also of their intellectual contributions. Now, I don't know if this story is true or not, Fran, but I want to tell it anyway. Uh, but he says, John, he says, there's a photo that I'm even much prouder of. He's, Richard claimed this now. You can tell us if he was lying. He said, on the cover of Life in the late 1960s, <clears throat> there's a photo of the occupation of Columbia University. And on the cover are these two long mini-skirted legs going through a window uh, at Columbia University as the students were occupying the, the uh, administration building, perhaps. He says, those are Fran's legs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is someone who has brought all of the things I think many of us in our discipline aspire to be, but rarely accomplish. Um, so that's all I'm going to say, Fran. It was plenty. <laughs> <laughs> now more people know about the Light Magazine. <laughs> it, it, it was actually a centerfold. It wasn't. Oh, it was a centerfold. <laughs> <laughs> Different building. <laughs> and Tom Hayden was reaching out to help me out. Oh, uh, yeah. So, it was easy to figure out what it was about. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, too much, but lovely. You know. Well, uh, probably lots of you, like me, have paid a lot of attention to social movements uh, in your work and in your political life. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, good. Uh, and, there are a number of movements that attract our excitement and our commitment for very good reasons, because they are liberatory, they're emancipatory, they contribute ultimately to humanizing our society. So we think about the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, it used to be called, or the gay liberation movement, or the environmental movement, or the global justice movement. But I'm going to talk today about another movement, the labor movement, the American labor movement, which was historically much more important. It loomed much larger because the labor movement, the faith in the labor movement, the hopes that labor would become a power in shaping societies uh, became, I think, the rock on which the faith of left politics was based for 150 years. That means socialist politics, social democratic politics, in the United States, Democratic Party politics. And the labor movement really had a lot of accomplishments to its credit over the century and more that it was active in politics. The labor movement was critically responsible for the expansion of democratic rights, especially in Western Europe. The labor movement also won a series of worker rights, wages and hours regulation, safety, workplace safety conditions, and also in the United States the right to unionize. And the labor movement was a critical support for a raft of public policies that we sometimes call the safety net, which were important in humanizing our societies. Pen public pensions, aid to, the, uh, aid to orphans, as we called it in the United States, but aid to the very poor, aid to the unemployed, aid to the disabled, and so on. Today in my country especially, but really to some extent in Canada as well, and in all rich countries, those achievements are in serious trouble. The, and the unions are shrinking. Uh, partly it's because of the contraction of the industries where the fabled unions were strong 
like steel and autos and coal. And also, working class neighborhoods are dispersing or they're being gentrified, working class towns. Uh, and, and another sort of mark of the labor movement, the left parties of the West are not doing so well. They've become catch-all parties, trying somehow or other in every which way to gain votes from here and from there and from everywhere. And a number of those parties have actually become the pioneers of neoliberalism in their countries. Well, as a consequence, the social policies we associate with labor strength are in danger. Economic inequality is soaring in all rich countries, but especially in the United States. The United States is at the forefront of all of these trends. Now, when you try to figure out why this is happening, the explanation that comes quickly to the lips of every pundit and comes straight out of the columns of the financial press is that it's because of globalization. And why is it because of globalization? Well, globalization means that worldwide global markets have been created in labor and in the goods manufactured by workers, which are traded across borders. And these global markets have created a race to the bottom, which weakens the labor market power of workers, but also weakens governments. Moreover, at the same time, we've seen a restructuring of domestic economies. Those auto and steel and uh, wor workers are shrinking, but so the factories in which they worked are closing down. Uh, even IT industries are shrinking in the United States. And this compounds the race to the bottom created by globalization. Well. I don't think so. I think I disagree with this view. I agree that there is globalization, and I agree that there is domestic restructuring. And I do think that these changes mean the decay of the old strategy, which strategies through which labor mobilized to exercise power. But still, there are workers, and there still is worker power. More people than ever are working for an employer. Now even most women are working for an employer. And I am going to argue that globalization, in fact, creates new potential sources of worker power, but that unions, having become institutionalized, crippled, by their alliances and their internal bureaucracies are not tapping those new sources of power. Well, so I'm going to talk about power, labor power. We really have, I've decided, <laughs> three different theories of labor power. Uh, the first theory that you hear a lot about lately is the theory that says labor has power when it has market power, when labor <coughs> markets are tight. In other words, when the supply of labor is scarce and the demand <coughs> for labor is high. Uh, the argument about why globalization undermines labor is a market argument. And a lot of unions also adopt this kind of argument. Uh, when SEIU, the big American labor union now, uh, calls for a strategy of restructuring to increase density in particular industries or particular sectors. They're talking about increasing the market power of workers and the unions that organize workers. They want to take, take wages out of competition, they say. Uh, or, and, and this is also the strategy that was followed by the AFL-Craft 
unions in the United States in the 19th century, the craft, the unions of carpenters and bricklayers and plumbers that actually flourished in the big cities of the United States through a, a kind of political strategy to enhance their market power because they got city ordinances which governed the kind of construction that could be done and with the consequence that their craft gained a monopoly over the plumbing business or over the carpentry business or over the bricklaying business. And, you know, it sort of worked. It didn't work for many workers, but for those who were the craftsmen who could organize a monopoly over the craft skill, it worked. Uh, so that's one theory of labor power. A second theory of labor power rests on political democracy, on electoral representative arrangements. And uh, this is sort of the social democratic theory of labor power. Here the idea is that with the winning of the mass franchise, uh, the winning of the universal or the near universal right to vote, and the development of par political parties that organized those votes, and the development of systems of representation, roughly in proportion to those votes, that with those developments, state elites became dependent on workers. Why? Because workers had so many votes. And according to theory, at least, the proletariat would steadily expand and become a majority of the population, so they would have majorities of votes. This was a very exhilarating idea. And it still is an exhilarating idea. You know, people die for the right to vote, still to this day. But, of course, the institutions that developed to organize those votes and to penetrate the cadres of representatives who campaigned for those votes did produce severe distortions. Just look at the American government and great disappointments. There's another idea about worker power. We sort of tend to forget it. I don't know how we can forget it. I think it's the idea implicit, at least, in the manifesto. It's the idea that in an industrial capitalist society, where industrial, as, where as industrial capitalism grows, it creates a labor force, brings together the peasantry and the artisans, it creates a labor force on which it, is, it becomes dependent, because labor is a force of production. Now, this interdependence, of course, produces the potential for disruption. Because if workers withdraw their labor, everything stops. Moreover, and this is what the manifesto is really good at, it's not as explicit about labor power as it is about the way in which industrial capitalism will organize and educate workers all these numbers and the unity that they will experience because they're working under the same roof, exposed to the same rotten foreman and owners, and then they'll have this leverage. Well, there were also institutional distortions to the, that followed in the wake of the periodic exercise of this third kind of labor power, the strike. Great strikes produced efforts on the part of government and employers to institutionalize strike power. In the United States, the mass strikes of the 1930s were responded to by the National Labor Relations Act, which produced the National Labor Relations Board and were also responded to by the great automobile companies like Chrysler and GM, by the big steel companies, 
with the rush to a contract. Now, what was going on was perfectly clear. Workers were walking off the job whenever things didn't meet their approval. Employers, big employers, were in a rush to find a way to ensure uninterrupted production, particularly as orders from wartime, wars torn Europe began to pick up. And so these big employers offered unions, offered leaders, fledgling unions, because they weren't, you know, industrial workers weren't yet unionized. They offered them the contract on condition that at least between contracts, at least so long as the contract was enforced, the union would take responsibility for ensuring uninterrupted production. And of course, the strike power was also institutionalized, in a sense academically, with the development of the field of industrial relations, which was presumably expert on proposing ways to smooth out the relations between managers and workers. Now, these sources of power, particularly political power, electoral representative power, and strike power, won workers a great deal in our society. The reason that we have public policies that are more humane than they were, say, in the early 19th century is because of this kind of power from below. Even today, workers through electoral representative politics and sometimes through strike threats, all that, though that is becoming rare, can claim victories. But still, it is all these kinds of power are said to be eroding. I've already said a little bit about why labor market power is said to be eroding. And it uh, has to do with the expansion of the labor market, in effect, to include the global south, as well as the female side of the population. Women are now in wage labor. That's a tremendous expansion of the supply of labor without comparable protections. Uh, and globalization has also made affected electoral representative power because globalization is said to make national governments helpless. Now, that's a vast overstatement, but certainly it is the usual view that because capital, after all, what makes a nation state a nation state a sovereign power, that it has authority over the resources and the people within its boundaries. But if capital can exit at will, the nation state has to kowtow to the demands of capital. Uh, the state is weakened, its power diminished. And if the, the state's power is diminished, well, electoral representative power only means something as power vis-a-vis -vis government. Well, also at the same time, electoral representative institutions have been weakened as a source of labor influence because of a kind of business political mobilization. Again, it has occurred everywhere. I don't think it's occurred anywhere as intensely as it has in the United States. Uh, it's a mobilization of business interest groups. They work our government, our national government, and our state governments too. They work them from the outside, and they are occupying them from the inside. It's incredible how many important, crucial government posts are now occupied by industry representatives. I mean, Hank Paulson, the secretary of the Treasury that pushed forward the first bank bailout 
was a Goldman Sachs guy. Again and again, these people turn out to be industry henchmen. Uh, so was Larry Summers, by the way. The, so it, it's interest group mobilization from the inside, from the outside, from the outside. It's really <coughs> formidable. We have in Washington now uh, something called K Street. Do you hear about K Street? Yeah? Well, you know, there was no K Street 30, 40 years ago. K Street came into being when big corporations all moved to Washington to establish lobbying headquarters. They changed the face of the city, in effect, uh, with their location. Uh, and, of course, the rise of business-oriented and closely related right-wing populist-oriented propaganda machines uh, the Fox Station phenomenon. The, there was recently a Supreme Court decision in the United States called Citizens United. In, the court decided that independent groups could not be limited in any way. It was a violation of the speech rights guaranteed by the Constitution in spending for election-related issues. So. I mean, it's always been too much money in politics, but now it's just, whoo, and a waterfall of money coming over the bridge, and nobody knows what's going to happen. Well, this business-led mobilization has concentrated on what? Well, cutting taxes, cutting the safety net, but a lot of it has been union busting. Uh, it was Ronald Reagan, uh, the first of a series of enthusiastically business-supported candidates, was responsible for the spectacular busting of the Air Controllers Union in PACO. Uh, the overall result is that union not, membership has shrunk. It's now about 7 or 8 percent in the private sector, 12 percent in the public sector. That 12 percent in the public sector doesn't mean as much as it you would hope because most public sector workers have been stripped of the right to strike by state law or by federal law. And I say, what is a union if it can't strike? It's just, just a civil service association still has some electoral influence, but not strike power. So, and then in, in the workplace as well, employers have become fierce union busters. The union busting in the United States was, was a pretty good business until the mid-1930s. We had Firms like the Pinkertons, they are the most famous, the most notorious. Uh, the Pinkertons, there were more people working for the Pinkertons than there were in the U.S. Army uh, early in the 20th century. And the Pinkertons busted strikes. Mainly they used spies and goons. Some employers had their own little armed forces, but you could always call on the Pinkertons. Well, these union-busting companies pretty much went out of business with the development of national law and policy to allow unionism and allow strikes under you know, strictly regulated conditions. Now they've come back. They started to come back in the 1970s. We have union-busting firms again. This time, now they don't hire goons. <clears throat> now they hire PR experts and lawyers. And they invite, advise employers about what to do if there is talk about union spreading in their company. The one-on-one -on -one conversations with foremen and managers, uh, the threats about we'll move to Mexico, uh, the Anyway, so 
The consequence is that a lot of unions have actually been decertified and union membership is growing, is, is shrinking. Now, unions are, of course, trying to ward this off. Uh, they're trying harder. They're certainly trying a lot harder to use what is their, in their view, their sole remaining source of power, which is electoral representative power, political power. They're trying to do better at election campaigns. And they are doing better at election campaigns. It has to be said, they are doing a lot better. Uh, they figured out how, in order to get their people out to vote, that you know the one-on-one, -on -one, member to member, uh, GOTV campaign works better. They, uh, they were very good on the Obama election. They managed to stifle what could have been a kind of racial reaction against the Democratic presidential uh, candidate didn't happen among union people or their families. So they're good on they're good on electioneering, turnout, registration to some extent. Uh, but it isn't having much effect. And the truth is, electoral represent uh, that kind of political power by itself has never been enough. The unions <coughs> have been trying since Taft Hartley to get Section 14B, which gives federal legitimation to right to state right to work laws. They've been trying to get it reversed for 50, 60 years. They throw all their support to the Democratic Party, and they get zilch in return. They're not going to get the Employee Free Choice Act, which was legislation which would have allowed them to unionize through card check instead of going through the Federal National Labor Relations Board, which doesn't work well for them. But they're not going to get that either. That's been dropped from the Democratic agenda. So they, they try. Uh, but they're not gaining anything. Well, I said earlier that I thought globalization created new sources of potential labor power. Now, let me try to that the unions can't, won't tap. And let me try to explain what I mean. Necessarily, globalization means increased specialization and integration. That's what we mean by extended chains of production. We mean the creation of a much more complex economy with many more interdependencies in it and a much, much more far-flung system of cooperation. Now, this is what allows capital to exit with the click of a mouse if they want to, if workers are giving them trouble in one place, but that has, and that may have the consequence of loosening capital's dependence on a particular group of workers, but this these extended chains of production, this outsourcing that everybody talks about, is two-sided or multi-sided. Lots of people are involved in it, and most of them are workers. And most of those workers are locked into far-flung extended systems of what I think is logistical power. Now, those of you who have paid attention to labor organizing know the special role that the idea of logistical power has had in past strike efforts. Logistical power is the power had by those workers who are at key nodes in a system of production or distribution. Dock workers can stop it. Nothing moves, for example. Well, 
lots of workers now have logistical power because the system is so extended and so integrated. Through, and, and besides that, the system also is dependent on the electronics and transportation. And transportation workers have always had logistical power. Some workers seem to show the sort of braggadocio associated with power. Uh, the Kosatu workers, for example, when they refuse to unload Israeli ships that they say are bound for Gaza. Or the longshoremen on the west coast of the United States. They take up political issues and do strike actions over them. But it's not just you know, the dock workers, the way it always has been. There are lots of workers are in a position to shut down complicated systems with very far-flung reverberations, which we should start to try to understand. Moreover, there also are armies of low-wage service workers who are in sectors that are not moving. These workers are rooted in place. They're the workers in the hospitals, the schools, the restaurants. Of course they still have labor power. And if you talk to organizers on the ground, it isn't true that those workers are not ready to unionize. What is true is the apathy, the demoralization of the effort, of those who are making the effort, if they are making the effort at all, to unionize them. So I want to propose that maybe there's another and different problem. Maybe the problem is in globalization and the lean economy. Maybe the problem is the institutionalization of labor in unions. Everywhere in the world, labor power, the expression of the mass strike, has led to unions. And it has led to what are sometimes called labor law regimes. Unions protected by labor law regimes, but also disciplined by labor law regimes. These unions become oligarchies, of course. This is the way of things. And in these oligarchies, there's a separation of leaders from rank and file. Uh, it's kind of inevitable. Leaders are more concerned with organizational maintenance, and on the one hand. And on the other hand, these same leaders have new ties, new connections that are critical to maintaining their organizations and their positions, and their often very generous earnings from those positions. And those new connections are with the firm, the company, and they're with the government. So maybe it's not surprising that even the best of these leaders cling to old labor, labor repertoires instead of exploring new labor strategies. You know, in 1933, a year that was a kind of low point, another low point, we're back down there nearly, uh, for labor organization. The AFL craft unions didn't want to do anything about organizing industrial workers. They resisted it. They said that, well, at one point, they allowed these workers to join up, but they wouldn't make them members of a regular local because they didn't have a craft or something. Uh, and after a few years, the strike movement of these industrial workers took off without the unions. These workers, insurgent leadership, local caucuses, sometimes some dissident union members, they led strikes. And when they did, 
the unions that were to become the CIO, a breakaway from the AFL, they ran after those strikes to try to catch up and assume the leadership and become the union leaders of the unions that the workers' strikes would win. So if we ask the question, are there union efforts to recoup, to do anything? Well, hear my answer. Of course the unions are trying stuff. I mean, they're not oblivious to the loss of standing, you know, in American popular culture, to their loss of members, to their loss of treasury, to their loss of influence. So yeah, they're trying to recoup, and in fact, in 1994, after being led by uh, two old oligarchs, miserable union leaders, George Meany and Lane Kirkland. George Meany was proud that he had never led a strike in his life. Uh, the unions, the AFL-CIO elected new leadership, it came to be called the New Voices Leadership. John Sweeney became president of the AFL-CIO, and the union, the union federation, declared its total commitment to organizing the unorganized. And there were there was new stuff in the New Voices leadership. For example, a completely new stance toward service sector workers. One of the problems was that the old union hierarchy had been so white and so male and so old. But now the New Voices leadership did promote, it had a different policy with regard to immigration. It was for the rights of the undocumented. The old AFL-CIO was very xenophobic. Uh, it was good on, better on gender and on race. And they, it, it, one of the unions, again the SEIU, even launched a Justice for Janitor campaign which became world famous in Los Angeles and actually won. But still, I think that these efforts are limited. Even when the AFL-CIO leadership undertakes them, they don't control the great national unions or the great national unions treasuries. No, all the resources of the unions are down below. That's where the money and the people are. They're not up there in Washington where John Sweeney meets with his advisors. And moreover, those national unions that do have some resources have been so preoccupied with jurisdictional disputes that I don't, they're trying to hold their own by taking over other unions. This is an old problem in the union movement, but it's quite, I find it really horrifying that this cannibalization is going on now, particularly with SEIU, the United Healthcare Workers in California, the fight between Unite and Here. These are fights for money and members. Uh, and in, how long ago was it now? Five years ago, several of these unions, SEIU, the Carpenters, the Teamsters, uh, Unite, pulled out of the AFL-CIO. They're sort of back now, but there never was a reason for it. You couldn't figure, excepting maybe they wanted the news money that they had paid to the AFL-CIO because nothing they did afterwards gave credibility to the reasons that they offered. So, there, so there is people, Union people are trying in a way, but certainly the electoral politics thing they're doing in a big way. And there are even, there are even some initiatives toward global unions. But the global union stuff is largely on the top. It's largely symbolic. It's largely or organizational efforts to bring, to build organizational ties rather than 
any more daring attempts to tap new sources of labor power. The, it may be, and this is what I actually think, that the leaders of the old unions, the leaders of union bureaucracy, are ill-positioned, really ill-suited to tap new sources of power, new sources of what is strike power. It's hard to do. Actions that are defiant, that break rules, that take chances, are hard to organize. You have to, you have to show your people that they really do have power, that they do work that is essential. That's what the Wobblies were all about, all their music about we who tilled the prairies, built the railroads. Boy, do they need us. You've got to... You've got to create that kind of culture. You've got to mobilize your people, organize your people. You need solidarity. You don't need members, but you need solidarity. You have to ward off all the external influences that tell you this can't be done. You're taking chances with what you've already got. It's going to be bad for your wife and for your cousins and such in, in Peoria. Uh, you, you've got to endure. If you're doing a strike, any of the various forms of strike that are made possible by the lean economy and globalization, you've got to be able to endure the suspension of the interdependent relationship that you're interrupting. But I think what's hardest of all is that you have to break rules. It's hard for people to break rules. But I also think we desperately need the kind of power that could be earned if labor were to revive and rediscover its ancient sources of power in work itself. Thank you.